Black Beauty. Chapter One In the Beginning. When I was very young, my life was gloriously happy. I galloped with other colts by day and slept by my mother's side at night. But when I was four years old, a man named Squire Gordon came to talk to my master, the horse breeder. He stroked my black coat and the white star on my forehead. Beautiful, he exclaimed. Break him in and I'll buy him. Then he touched the white patch on my back. It's like a beauty spot, he said. I'll call him Black Beauty. I shook with fear. I was going to be sold. Would I have to leave my mother? And what was breaking in? You must learn to wear a saddle and bridle, my mother explained. Then the groom thrust a cold steel bar into my mouth and held it there with straps over my head and under my throat. There was no escape. At first, the bar frightened me, but with kind words and treats of oats, I learned to get used to it. Just before I was taken to Squire Gordon, my mother spoke to me for the last time. Now, Black Beauty, she whispered, be brave. All young horses must leave their mothers to make their way in the world. Just remember, never bite or rear or kick. And whatever happens, always do your best. When Squire Gordon's groom arrived, he jumped on my back and we rode away. I cantered through twisting villages until we reached a long avenue. Apple orchards stretched out on either side. The groom led me into a large, airy stable with plenty of corn and hay. A friendly whinny from the next stall made me look up. A fat little pony with a thick mane and tail was poking his head over the rail. I'm Merry Legs, he said. Welcome to Birtwick Park. That was John who rode you here, Mary Legs went on. He's the best groom around, and Squire Gordon is the best owner a horse could have. You'll be happy here. A tall chestnut mare glared at Mary Legs. Trouble is, no one knows how long a good home will last, she snapped. I've had more homes than you've had hot oats. Meet Ginger, said Mary Legs. She bites. That's why she keeps getting sold, even though she's so handsome. Angrily, Ginger tore at a wisp of hay in her manger. You don't know anything, she muttered. If you'd been through what I have, you'd bite too. Poor Ginger, I thought. What could have made her so unhappy? Chapter 2 Ginger story. Over the next few days, John took me out. At first we went slowly, then we trotted and cantered, and ended up in a wonderful speedy gallop. Well, John, how is my new horse? asked Squire Gordon. First rate, sir, replied John, grooming me carefully. Black Beauty's as swift as a deer, as gentle as a dove, and as safe as houses. A lady's horse, perhaps, asked the squire's wife, feeding me pieces of apple. Oh, yes, Mrs. Gordon. He'll be a good carriage horse, too. We could try him out with Ginger, John suggested. So I was paired up with Ginger to pull the carriage. During our journeys, she told me the story of her life. If I'd had your upbringing, I might be good-tempered like you, she began. My first memory is of a stone being thrown at me. Poor you, I said, but Ginger hadn't finished. When my first owner broke me in, he shoved a painful bit in my mouth, she went on. 
Do as I say. I reared up in pain and he fought me with his whip until blood poured from my flanks. And then he cut off my tail. Why? I cried. I'd noticed Ginger had no tail, but thought she must have lost it in an accident. Delightful. Fashion, Ginger replied bitterly. Some people think horses look better with a stump. Now I have nothing to whisk flies away with. She sighed. It's agony when they crawl on me and sting. Horrible, I snorted. That's not all. My first owner sold me to a rich London gentleman who put me in a bearing rein. A what? I asked. It's a tight rein that pulls your neck all the way back. Imagine your tongue pinched, your jaw jerked upright, and your neck on fire with pain. Everyone thought I looked wonderful, but oh, how it hurt. Kindness wins us, not painful whips, said Ginger. But we're lucky here, she said at last. Squire Gordon hates bearing reins, and John is teaching young Joe, our new groom, to be just as good as he is. And I'm trying to behave now because everyone's so kind. Chapter 3. Horses Know Best Soon after this, Mrs. Gordon fell ill. We didn't see her for weeks. Then one stormy night, John rushed to the stables. Best foot forward, beauty, he cried. We must ride as hard as we can to fetch the doctor. Mrs. Gordon is at death's door. We galloped into lashing rain while thunder and lightning raged around us. Leaves and twigs danced in the air, torn from their branches by a savage wind. As we got to the main road, a terrible splitting sound crashed through the darkness. A huge tree had fallen in our path. Gathering all my strength, I jumped and sailed over it. At last, we reached the bridge. I could hear the river roaring, but the moment I stepped onto the bridge, I stopped. Come on, beauty, John urged. I couldn't move. I could tell something was wrong. John gave me a light touch of the whip, but I stayed like a statue. Just then, the moon lit up the bridge. We saw the far end had collapsed into matchsticks, tossing in the raging water. Well done, beauty, John cried. We would have been killed, but I'm afraid it's ten miles to the next bridge. We'll have to hurry. You understand me, don't you, black beauty? Gallop and get there, I murmured to myself. Gallop and get there. The faster I said it, the faster I went. I raced home with both John and the doctor on my back. I'd never been so tired in my life. You're steaming like a kettle, said young Joe. You're too hot for your blanket. Here, have some ice cold water. And through the night I shivered and sweated and longed for John to come. When he arrived, he was horrified. Joe, you've nearly killed Beauty, he shouted. He's caught a bad chill. You should have put on his blanket, and that icy drink did him no good at all. I didn't know, Joe muttered sulkily. Didn't know, yelled John. You should make it your business to know. If you don't know, ask. Will he die? I hope not. I'm sorry, wept Joe. I didn't mean to hurt him. With careful nursing, I recovered, but Joe never forgot the lesson he had learned. Chapter 4. A Terrible Time Mrs. Gordon got better too, but the doctor said she must live in the sun to be really well. Goodbye, Ginger. Everything was to be sold. Burtwick Park, Mary Legs, Ginger, and me. Mary Legs went to the priest. The priest says I'll never be sold. Lucky you. What'll happen to us? We said goodbye under the apple trees where we'd talked and played so happily. I never saw Mary Legs again. 
Ginger and I were sold to Lord and Lady Richmore. John had tears in his eyes when he handed us over to Reuben, our new groom. Look after that temper, Ginger. Next day, Lord and Lady Richmore came to inspect us. They look very nice, Reuben, announced Lady Richmore. They can pull my carriage, but you must put their heads up high. Squire Gordon never used a bearing rein, Lord Richmore reminded her. Well, I won't have horrible, common-looking horses, snapped Lady Richmore. Reuben pulled my head back and fixed the rein tight. I felt red-hot pain. Ginger tried to jerk her head away, but Reuben forced her rein like mine. This is agony. Instantly, I saw why Ginger hated it. I couldn't put my head down to take the strain of pulling the carriage. As the strength drained out of us, Reuben whipped us on. At last, we came to a grand courtyard crammed with horses and carriages. Ginger couldn't take it anymore. With a wild neigh, she reared up, scaring all the horses who crashed into each other, kicking madly. Our carriage toppled over and broke to pieces. Lady Richmore tumbled out, unharmed but furious. That horse ought to be shot. Ginger was taken away forever. I longed to know what happened to her, but no one mentioned her name again. I didn't trust Reuben. He oozed politeness to the Richmores, but secretly he drank too much. One evening, he took me out for a ride on a road made of fresh laid sharp stones. My shoe was loose, but Reuben was too drunk to notice. He never heard the clatter of my shoe falling off. I don't think he even noticed me limping. My hoof split and I couldn't help it. I fell onto my knees. Reuben shot to the ground, hit his head on the cobbles and lay there not moving. I stayed with Reuben all through the night. When morning dawned, a group of early walkers came by. They were shocked at the sight of us. That's Reuben, they shouted. Dead, poor bloke. Thrown by that horse, vicious brute. That'll be the end of him. No one knew what really happened. And what would they do to me now? Chapter 5. Life is a Puzzle I'm going to sell that bad-tempered black beauty to any fool who wants him, Lord Richmore announced. He's no beauty now. He's scarred for life. I was sorry for Reuben, but I couldn't help being thrilled to be leaving Lord and Lady Richmore. I was put into a horse sale. Buyers prodded me and stared at me, but no one wanted me. Isn't he ugly with those nasty knees, I heard someone say, and he's got a bad temper. Finally, a kind-looking man paid a small sum of money for me and took me away. The man's name was Jerry Barker, and he lived in London with his wife and children, Harry and the twins, Polly and Molly. I want you to be my cab horse, Jerry told me. I'll call you Jack. It was strange to have a new name. My job was to be harnessed to Jerry's carriage, which he called his cab, and pick up passengers when they hailed us in the street. We worked hard, out all day in all weather, rain, sleet, snow, and ice, with hardly any rest. I didn't mind anything because Jerry was such a kind, honest man. I wanted to do my best for him. He made sure I was always comfortable and had plenty of food. He never whipped me to go faster, even if customers in a hurry bribed him with extra cash. You'll never be rich, the other cab drivers jeered. I have enough, thanks, Jerry replied. It's not fair on Jack to make him hurry all the time. Other cab horses weren't so lucky. I often saw them exhausted and miserable, made old before their time with too much work. Once I saw an old worn out chestnut with a thin neck and bones that stuck out through a badly kept coat. Its eyes had a dull, hopeless look. I was wondering why the horse looked faintly familiar when I heard a whisper. Black Beauty, is that you? 
It was Ginger. Her beautiful looks had completely vanished. She told me she belonged to a cruel driver who whipped her, starved her, and overworked her. You used to stand up for yourself if people were mean to you, I said. Yes, I did once, but now I'm too tired, she replied. I just wish I could die. No, Ginger, I cried. Keep going. Better times will come. I hope they do for you, Black Beauty, she whispered. Goodbye and good luck. Get on! Soon after that meeting, I saw a cart carrying a dead chestnut horse. It was a dreadful sight. I think it was Ginger. I almost hope it was, for that meant her suffering was over. Chapter 6 An Unexpected Ending One day, a customer of Jerry's made him an offer he couldn't refuse. She asked him to be her groom at her house in the country. There's a little cottage for you and your family, she said. I wish I could take Jack too, but I already have a horse. Sorry, old Jack, Jerry comforted me. I hope someone kind will buy you. But my new master was a cruel man. I had to pull his carts loaded with sacks of corn, and if I was too slow, he whipped me hard. He hardly fed me either, which made me weak. In the end, I simply collapsed in the street. Stupid horse, my master grunted. Is he dead? What a waste of money. I couldn't move. As I lay there barely breathing, someone came up and poured water down my throat. A gentle voice said, He's not dead, only exhausted. Take him. He's no use to me. The gentle voice belonged to a horse doctor. I couldn't believe my luck. The doctor helped me to my feet and led me to his stables where he gave me a warm mash. I think you were a good horse once, said the doctor, though you are a poor, broken-down old thing now. I'm going to feed you up and find you a nice home. Rest, good food, and gentle exercise worked on me like magic. But when the doctor said I was ready to leave him, I trembled all over. I dreaded to think what my next home would be like. The doctor took me to a pretty house in a small village. It had a pasture and a comfortable stable and belonged to two grown-up sisters, Claire and Elspeth Lyfield. I'm sure we'll like you, they said, patting me. You have such a gentle face. I nuzzled them, but I wasn't sure I could trust them. Their groom led me to the stable and began to clean me. That white star is just like Black Beauty's, he said, and the glossy black coat. He's about the same height, too. I wonder where Black Beauty is now. Soon he came to the tiny knot of white hair on my back. That's what Squire Gordon called Beauty's Patch. It is Black Beauty. It really is. Do you remember me? Young Joe who nearly killed you? I was so glad to see him. I've never seen a man so happy either. I've been here now for a year. Joe is always gentle. Claire and Elspeth are kind and my work is easy. All my strength has come back and I've never been happier. The sisters have promised never to sell me. Finally, I found my home forever and ever. The end. I truly hope you enjoyed the story of Black Beauty. God bless each one of you. Have a wonderful night and until next time, bye for now.